thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, joining me here for uh, for a little talk. Uh, Emeritus Professor Steve Pine from uh, Arizona State University, possibly the only, if not one of the only fire historians of the world. I uh, became familiar with your uh, your work recently and immediately thought, wow, that's very interesting in relation to my own interest in sacred fire. So, yes, thank you very much for taking the time here. So, <laughs> Well, it, it's great to be able to speak to a fellow uh, pyromantic, if I may use that term. <laughs> and I will say we are not pyromaniacs. We, we are fascinated by fire and uh, find it enlightening. And, cool, uh, yes. Exciting, so. <laughs> is that what a pyromantic means that you find uh that that you are um attracted to fire usually mantics well, uh, that's something yeah. about prophecy isn't it or well uh, that's uh pyromancy i think where okay. you stare into the flame and it it creates a kind of trance or there are messages to be read in it pyromantic is my term i've invented it okay. it's a romantic with regard to fire there are uh, romantics okay. for mountains and romantics for oceans i'm i'm a romantic for fire you so. should uh you should meet ian walton Lanner uh in england who i met uh actually last week because that is a pyromantic if uh if there is such a thing <laughs> He has basically uh, like devoted himself to to these old fire ceremonies of uh, different wow. churn fires and and so on and uh, and yeah. Cool. Well, I it's it's been an interesting career to be a fire historian. When I I started my first book, a rather large book on the U.S., uh, was forty years ago, and you know nobody knew what to do with it. What did, I mean, it was interesting. Oh, this is kind of novel, but. Nobody really cares about fire. And yeah. there was told, well, there's no future in fire. Uh, and suddenly the world has changed. Yeah. And what I did, just because I thought it was fascinating and useful, and I I thought fire really did matter for yeah. humans in the world. And suddenly it's being confirmed all around us now, yes. somewhat grotesque ways, but Nonetheless, so it's been an odd career. I I didn't I wasn't clairvoyant. I always thought fire was a big deal, and mattered. But now now the world has decided to agree with me. Yes, <laughs> so. yeah. <laughs> I, I I I can I can kind of image that when you say that fire uh, fire matters to us. Um, I've heard that. Uh, our species, Homo sapiens, that basically that the our I don't know domestication of fire came so early in our development that it shaped our food, um, and thereby it basically shaped our fission fission what's it called in English physiognomy our our, our physical uh, yeah. build of our bodies as Homo sapiens sapiens is that is that true. Well, there's a lot of evidence that suggests it is true, and it began with uh, Homo erectus. Okay. Uh, maybe before, because erectus already has the signature uh, anatomy of of a species that can cook. So uh, that changed our jaws, it changed our guts, it changed our head shape, and allowed all kinds of other things. And I think cooking, which seems so mundane, turns out to be really fundamental because in many ways that's the model pyrotechnology and we cook stone we cook metal we we cook sand to get glass we we cook everything uh, the whole basis for chemistry is essentially cooking so um and i agree with that i uh, the way i like to put it is that um so we have had that all of our existence as a species for a while, there were several species that could do it. Now we're the only one. So we we are a species monopolist now yeah. on fire. Yeah. So we're a uniquely fire creature on a uniquely fire planet. So it that's is. a pretty special characteristic for us. But we got big heads and small guts because we learned to cook food. And then we went to the top of the food chain because we learned to cook landscapes. And <laughs> now we've become a geologic force because we've begun to cook the planet. Yeah. You could say we we uh, we learned at some point to cook ore and make iron out of it, perhaps. 
Uh, I'm not sure if the metaphor. We used, we used there, it. But... There, there's a great uh, medieval text, uh, De Re Metallica Agricola, a classic Renaissance text, lots and lots of woodcuts. And it's remarkable how many of them have fire in it uh, as a catalyst. You use fire to break the rocks to help mine. Uh, you use fire uh, to cook uh, the stone uh, to to help uh, smelt the ore out of it. Then you use fire in the ore itself. I mean, we cook limestone to get cement. We uh, it just it just goes on and on. Uh, and we've it's... forgotten that that's fire because we have surrogates now for it. Yeah, but it's really like. Fire is, in a sense, the primordial energy source. If you went to an Iron Age society, yeah. any source that you have for uh, for uh, heat or light uh, is like light. You have uh, actually heavenly bodies, and you have fire, heat. You have body fire, a body heat, and you have fire. In medieval times, people basically build their houses together with stables to exploit a little bit of the body heat from from far livestock animals right so it's and in a sense that's also it's, combustion it's just inside the stomach right. of a cow right and uh, so so in a sense fire is the energy source uh in in for humanity it's the same chemistry yeah when it when it happens in our body we call it respiration when it happens in the wide world we call it fire but <laughs> And that's 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 useful to remember because we we've, we've thought at least since the enlightenment we've always thought of fire as a physical chemical process that we can break down and put into machines and do other things with which is exactly one of the reasons we're divorced from it now but uh, it's fundamentally a biological creation i mean life created the oxygen life creates and organizes the fuel and if we consider ourselves Life supplies most of the ignition on the planet. So, I, I noticed in your in your sacred fire video, you were talking about uh, some of the Slavic references to fire or the the not fire, the emergency fire, a living fire. And there's a lot of sort of folk um, analogies that the fire is alive; it's a beast; it's it's eating, and in many ways, uh, that's apt. Fire is not itself alive, but it's a creation of the living world, and it requires the living world to spread. So in some ways, I think of it as a virus. So is a virus really alive? No, but it's completely dependent and created by the living world, and fire takes on those properties. So it has many of the same kinds of relationships, many of the same kinds of characteristics. You could say it's an organism in, this, in, in in a similar way as a virus. I think that's interesting. It's analogous to a virus. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. not exactly alive, but it can behave. It, it yeah. breathes. It feeds. It moves. Um, it leaves residue after itself. I mean, in many ways. It procreates. It procreates, yeah. Uh, uh, in yeah. lots of ways. So. Let me just connect back to uh, one of the first things you said sure. here and just emphasize I mean, for me, a really jaw-dropping point that we, as our as a biological species, has basically come into being. Or we are shaped by a symbiotic relation with fire. I mean, the fact that we are a species created or co-created with the existence of fire, I think that is. Uh, an absolutely amazing fact, but because yeah. it basically it, yeah. it it says it says like in our cell structure and our DNA we are basically connected to fire. There's a lot of people who talk a lot about DNA today, and and DNA is or epigenetics and all these kind of things is being kind of used in all weird kind of ways that often seem like they don't seem based in in natural science, yeah. but this is real. I, I like how our our DNA is basically shaped by our right. symbiotic relation with fire. I find that incredibly, uh, like, yeah, amazing fact to think about. It's in our genome. Yeah, and it's it's which makes it all the more perverse how abusive our relationship with fire has become, yeah. and how 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 
amok that whole process. I mean, fire has always been our best friend, but we've made it our worst enemy. Yeah. Can and, you make, can you, you mentioned just uh, a couple of moments ago that there is a loss of relation. Uh, yeah. Can you describe the, your, your, like your overview of history in that relation between humanity and fire and where that, that rupture emerges? Sure. Well, it comes in, it, I, I would say it's certainly in the West and the degree the West has influenced the rest of the world. There are, there are two uh, inflection points. And one, one is the church and the church doesn't really uh, destroy it. It uh, baptizes it. It absorbs it in the same way that it absorbs in a sense, local deities or things. They become saints. They become part of it. It, 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 it accepts it. It was very, capable of doing that. It certainly denounced pagan or heathen rites, uh, but it was perfectly accepting to have them Christianized and and built into the liturgy. So that doesn't fundamentally change it. It, it alters it. The big change is during the Enlightenment. And I would say uh, two incidents at the end, towards the end of the 18th century, and one is the discovery of oxygen. And with that, fire combustion simply becomes a chemical process that is shaped by its physical surroundings. So you have removed fire from its landscape. You have removed fire from its former relationship, and it has become just a tool, uh, a process tool that we that we use. And the second part of that was taking that capacity and putting it into machines. So the steam engine and all of its successors come in. And so I'm in a place right now where I am heated and warmed and I'm running the Zoom session off electricity, which is coming from combustion, but I don't see any of it. I don't see any fire in this. I get in my car and drive. Uh, okay, we're converting to electricity, but still a lot of the electricity is still coming out. of. We don't see it. We're completely separated from that. And that's also the time when fire disappears as an element. Naturalists don't talk about fire. There would be celestial fires and anything that had heat and light, terrestrial fires, volcanoes were fire. Fire was a kind of all suffusing element. And there were some that we would now call technically fire, others that were analogous fires. But fire was all around and that all disappears. And the fires themselves begin disappearing. So we remove them from homes. We replace them. Uh, you know, even a century or a little over a century ago, if you walked into a home or an office or a factory, you would have working fires all around you. Various various appliances that are holding them, doing different things, manifesting itself. To, but they would be working fires. They're all gone. And maybe we have a few ceremonial fires, but fire is essentially gone unless it appears as a disaster in a city, something, a war, there's some other some other social breakdown. So I think that completely ruptured the relationship we had had with fire before. Because previously, and it was a burden, like any relationship, it took it had obligations, it gave us power, but we had to take care of it. I mean, we had to birth it, we had to raise it, we have to feed it, we have to clean up after it, uh, we we have to take care of it. It's not like a hammer that you can put on a shelf and then pick up again whenever. If you want that fire, you either have to remake it, it's a process. Uh, and um, that means that you have to organize your social life. I mean, how much effort in in many developing countries now still goes to collecting firewood? each day. I mean, it's a huge task, but that's also part of the ongoing. You very clearly see how all this is woven into human life. So some of that I'm happy for. I'm glad my house is not at risk from fire, accidental fire in the way it might have been in the past. I'm glad I don't have smoke escaping in the house occasionally. I'm happy for all of that, but there there are trade-offs, and we, we have decided we don't really, we can take fire's power. We have reduced it to a, a power source. 
and we and, can use that. It's a factory farm. I mean, I look at these combustion, these coal-fired power plants. This is a factory farm for fire instead exactly. of chickens or, or pigs. So that moves it out of our sphere, and that also, on a global scale, makes it run amok. You, you, you use was that the yeah. term you used or? Yeah, run amok. I'm sorry, it's kind of a, sl a little slangy term, but that it it's out of control. Yeah. And, you know, we ought to, it ought to give us a pause. We're looking at these mega fires and the damaging they have done. I mean, we've, all throughout the, the Mediterranean Rim, I mean, Island of Rhodes, for example, had major tourists. Hawaii uh, in the United States uh, burned through a, a city. Uh, all of these really large damaging fires are in developed countries. Why is that? This is the pathology of the developed world. Yeah, yeah, it's and the pathology uh, that, of our our yeah, and it's yeah, it's not just climate change. Mm. Going to a fossil fuel society changes how we organize agriculture. It organizes how we deliver power. It, it organizes roads, transport. I mean, all this kind of stuff, and that is what fire is integrating that. You know, and we but, also yeah. lost fire disappears as an intellectual subject, except as combustion chemistry mm. and yes. mechanical engineering. Yeah. So, oh. uh, you know, the line I like to use, I'm sorry, here, I'll shut up in a sec, is that all the other ancient elements, earth, air, and water, have academic disciplines devoted to their study, whole departments. In universities, the only university department, fire department, is one that sends engines when an alarm sounds. Yeah. How did fire disappear, even as an intellectual subject? Yeah. Anyway, I think, I think it's it's, it's an incredibly <laughs> it's just, interesting. I mean, when you start thinking about it, you wonder how did this happen? Yeah, yeah. and how did it how did it uh, become so incredibly displaced? in our culture like I'm, I'm a historian of religion so so when i meet a guy like i mentioned here ian ian uh, walton in in uh, in england who is devoting himself to these ancient fire techniques i'm asking myself why is it like why do you have to go to 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 uh, the countryside in england and and you find find a man who has devoted himself why is it not like the bishop of canterbury who's or or, or why is it not why yeah. is it not such a widely dispersed thing that 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 the, that because it has been so central in north european culture and probably in in many cultures and and you sometimes see reflection of it, like for instance, when when um, uh, when it's Christmas, you, you will see that cities are lit up by Christmas lights, uh, and these uh, so there, there's like little uh, diode uh, lamps all over town and so on. And this is in a sense a reflection of older traditions right. where uh, you light specific fires at the darkest time of year, uh, but again. You have the 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 abstraction that there isn't there isn't a sense that this is fire anymore that is detached in some distant uh, some dis some distant com combustion plant somewhere probably right so uh, so that the, there is an incredible disappearance of that element in our culture. That's right, and it wouldn't matter if we were just living in our cities and towns. But when we extend that into the countryside and into more remote areas, we get these huge, uh, catastrophic fires because yeah. they're no longer they're no longer domesticated or even pretending to be domesticated anymore. And we are no longer fire keepers no. in that way. No yes. longer the keeper of the flame. We, and so we have no understanding of the give and take that those re old relationships had. I think no, it's, a, it's. I mean, it's I can't. Why is it that you know the richest, most technologically advanced countries, um, with the with the greatest science, are the ones that are being overrun by uncontrolled fire? Yeah, yeah. 
I think it's 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 a very strong image that we have stopped being fire keepers keepers. Yeah. Like when you look at, for instance, the the old fire uh, prayers that that or at least the ones that I've looked at, there is always that there there is that it is a prayer to fire. Often they will say stuff like, "Go this far or, or keep us warm." But then don't go any further. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. that sense that it is also it can be a dangerous thing. It can run out of out of uh, hand, and um, I think with we obviously like when we talk about the the mega fires uh, or continent wild wide wildfires in Canada or Australia that we've seen in the past years. Um, then we are talking. Then it is as if combustion has ha, has gone out of hand on a global yeah. scale. Yeah. That we like the 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 massive burning of of uh, fossilized carbon that is in in a, in a geological time time frame. It's happening yeah. in an instant. It's almost like an explosion of uh, a burning. Like if if you, if we think of the, of the Earth in a in a geological theological time frame you know um yeah well it's also uh, i mean fire spreads by contagion mm. and again that's sort of the virus so what we're seeing is a global pandemic of combustion yeah yeah this uh the the um in the nordic uh, uh history there's a, there's a there's the prophecies of the end of the world yeah uh called the ragnarok or the Ragnarok, you know, in English, and uh, and that that uh, poses like the ultimate, or one of the perhaps one of the ultimate sort of agents of destruction is the fire giant Surtur, who is uh, consuming the tree of life, the ash, Yggdrasil, and yeah. there are these images of fire and flames that scorch the sky, and and uh, and it's it's very much a sense of uh lost connection because when you look at the nordic mythology you have this sense that there are forces of order and they are in some sort of complex multifaceted web of relation with these giants or the forces of chaos but when but when this relation breaks then they end in confrontation and fire Fire running amok, much like you describe, is 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 an uh, is an aspect of that. The fire that consumes the uh, the the world, basically the ordered world. But the world regrows, mm. and and that's the other side. That's the other side of fire. It destroys, but it also renews. Yes, and um, that's uh, there is a, a tradition of great fires in Stoic philosophy uh, from Roman times where periodically the world would have to be renewed. So the world has sort of been farmed and now it's fallow and now it's going to, to burn and and uh, yeah, it's just it, it's uh, bad luck for those who are alive at the time, but uh, this is how things go. And uh, one of the things I enjoyed about your uh, your sacred fire video was your emphasis on materiality. And this is how this is how I like to think of fire too and fire ceremonies that they are based in how fire actually behaves in the world, and that's what fire does. It destroys. I mean, that's the basis of slash and burn agriculture. It's the basis of following uh, and burning. All these old systems relied on fire at some point to renew it, and so many fire ceremonies. What did they do? Well, they fertilize. Uh, and they fumigate, or so they they purge the bad and promote the good if it if it's done well, and that that's exactly how fire behaves uh, in the world as people understood it. So I like that's the sense of my materiality. I, I came to fire by accident um, uh, a few days after graduating from high school. Uh, by accident, I found myself on a forest fire crew at the okay. North Rim of Grand Canyon National Park, which which has a wonderful forest. We're quite high in elevation and uh, lots of fires, most start by lightning. And it was, I was immersed in a different world and that world was organized by fire. 
if if fires come, everybody's happy. We make some extra money. We have stories to tell. And uh, if fires don't come, then everybody's unhappy and they're bored. And you have to find things to keep them busy, which is always a problem. And I began to wonder, uh, you know, being then going to college uh, and then eventually becoming an academic, you do what academics do, you abstract. And I wondered if that was the same organizing presence for fire that I saw on the North Rim it might be true generally for, for humanity. And so that's where my own sort of interest came. And fire was never taught at any place I was at school. I mean, I don't think it was taught anywhere. It was. It, it was no longer a subject. Yeah. Uh, so you had to write the books yourself. Looking up and little fragments here and there, but nobody studied fire. It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't entertaining. Uh, so that my my task became well, take the training I'd been given and see if I could make sense out of this. But that's where it comes from. So for me, it became very much out of that relationship, that that sense of being, you know, at the one end of a shovel and a fire at the other end and uh, dealing with it. And in that case, you develop, I like your animism. There's a sort of animistic quality to fire. And not that there's some spiritual mysticism or whatever, but the same way that a hunter might relate to prey. Um, there is an animating quality fire book. So we would come back, we would have a lightning fire bust, as we called it maybe five or six fires. So we're all scattered around the place. Then we all come back later and we're sitting around the campfire outside our <laughs> our little uh, cabin and drinking some beer. And we're telling stories about the fires. The very human thing, you sit around a fire and you tell stories. Yeah. And there's interesting research now how much human culture and some foraging societies is generated around the fire. And so the fires take on a certain personality. This was really a fun fire. This was a sweet fire. This was a horrible fire. This fire should not have been allowed to exist in the solar system. That's how bad this fire was. Other fires are unlucky or accident. But they all, that's how you begin talking about fire. And it's not that you personify it in a stupid kind of way, but that you're having to engage with this fire. <laughs> It's an engagement. I'm close with it. And you begin, that's how I learned to talk about fire and to think about it. And then I tried to convey that into my writing. So that's where, so I welcome your materiality. Sometimes you read about fire stuff and people are abstracting each level. And I'd like to go the other way and say, where does this come from? What experiences did people have that made it seem likely that we throw, we throw witches and, and cats or whatever into the bonfires to destroy them. Okay, is there anything else coming out of this? Or why do you jump over fires um, for fertility? Uh, well, that's exactly what you do in a field. And yeah. smoke is very good as a fumigator. Yeah. Purgative. So any, I'm sorry, I'm running on here. You get no, me talking super about interesting. fire. I could go on for a long time. Yeah, but it's it's uh, it's super interesting and great points. I I, I think the, the, the image of humanity sitting around the fire, like one thing is that our bodies apparently and amazingly are shaped by our relation to fire. Our culture is in a, in a similar way perhaps even more it is a fire bound phenomenon we create culture when we sit around fire and like we all know the experience of sitting around a fire and that that, that particular like feeling of perhaps a community of, of a group of people yeah. sitting around a fire and and a calm of sitting and looking at the fire uh that is probably a result of of this particular situation being uh, birth, a birth setting of central parts of what it means to be human. It's just been a part. It's been a companion mm. with us forever. And I think of some of the earliest encounters, Europeans with the uh, Australian indigenous, and they thought for several decades, the indigenous didn't know how to start fire. That's how primitive they were technologically well they did but they preferred to carry it with them and this is the hottest and driest of all the continents 
And for 50 or 60,000 years, you've been wandering around with burning, <laughs> or at least, uh, you know, glowing uh, fire sticks. And how did that, how can that survive? Well, it's because you've been doing it for uh, thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And so you've all worked out a kind of accommodation, but they were never without fire. Fire was just there. So it doesn't have to be mystical necessarily, but it's a continual presence. And a relationship, you still have to take care of it. You have to carry it. I mean, you, you know, and I think that's completely gone. And I see, I mean, yeah. What about the culture of controlled burning of, say, landscapes or wilderness? Uh, and this is, it's not something that I know a lot about, but I've sort of heard people talk yeah. about these burnings as, uh, for instance, ways of imitating, uh, or, or basically that that they they are being done in ways that are very beneficial to biodiversity, or that they they in some way have a positive e effect on landscapes. Well, that's that's true. What what's odd? I mean, looking at it from a longer perspective of history is how recent this rediscovery is. This is something humans have done forever. And we forgot it, or we we suppressed it. We we found technological substitutes and some, or we outlined, just suppressed it, and we used our new fire machines to do it. I mean, take away all the aircraft and helicopters and bulldozers and engines, could we pretend to fight fire in landscapes? Of course not. We would have to do what people had always done. But for a while, this gave us the illusion that we could we could eliminate that fire which sometimes gets out of control, which smokes and nobody likes smoke, et cetera, et cetera, and, and do that. And now we're having to rediscover what had been there for thousands, and in some places, tens of thousands of years. And it's not just indigenous. Right now, it's caught up with a lot of indigenous and colonial issues. Fine. But Europe, as you well know, had its traditional knowledge of fire, which, which was lost was deliberately removed. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite examples, again, uh, sort of the, the Enlightenment impact, even even before uh, uh, oxygen, uh, Linnaeus, you, you studied at, the, at Uppsala? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing it badly. But That's Linnaeus, funny. on his last of his, his travels, was to uh, Skona, uh, to the southern southern province, and he went, uh, went through uh, Smoland, his his home uh, province, and he wrote some passages favoring fire, which was very useful for grazing here. It was a moranic soil, and you can't plow it. And he was forced to delete those passages. <laughs> the Minister of Agriculture would not allow any favorable comment about fire because fire is primitive. You know, fire is archaic, um, and fire is causing a backward agriculture and we need we need modern rational uh, approaches and so he had to re remove that comment and put in a paragraph about manure so cow okay. manure was, was better i mean this is linnaeus yeah i mean he's at the height of his powers i mean he's honored on, i think two currencies in sweden i mean you know he's a culture culture hero uh, yeah. but then he was still he was still and that's and particularly Northern Europeans, as, as the science begins spreading, are very clear that if you use fire, you are primitive. So the fact that you study fire and you're interested uh, in animism fits. That that fits the model perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and if you find an alternative uh, to fire, then you are rational. And they're very clear about this. And so fire was just Fire was what we had to purge, and the church, uh, the Catholic Church, was was much more successful at absorbing it and remaking it in domesticated forms. Mm. And the Enlightenment doesn't. Yeah. It just we can replace this, and this yeah. is an emblem of everything we're fighting against. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's this it's, isn't an anti-science rant. I'm just saying that this is how it plays out. It disappears. Yeah. Who studies fire? Yeah. Nobody. 
it's it's interesting. Uh, uh, my father uh, actually told me that that uh, as a child he came up on the first of May on May Day uh, and saw that there were some standing stones where there had been a fire, and that was uh, done in 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 the night because it was it was illegal to burn fires on those stones. It was something that people had been doing forever, but uh it, it was considered uh destructive to that place which is like people <laughs> people are burning pyres on hills with standing stones on it it's it, it that is you know why that place is there uh but for some reason that was considered uh that was considered bad uh i yeah. actually remember myself uh being part of burning fields, but that was just burning fields as a child, uh, where we, uh, where there was, uh, you know, uh, leftovers of straw in the, in the field, we would always mm -hmm. go and, and burn that. Uh, but that's not, it's not the same scale as, you know, if you have, uh, indigenous Australians burning a, a grassland or, or something like that, that's of course well, a, a they, very different. Well, they, these are not uncontrolled fires. They, these mm. small scale burns are very helpful. They create a mosaic, mm. and it is that mosaic which is where most of the biodiversity resides. And so, this was a kind of quasi domesticated mosaic built in with agriculture. I mean, the fact that until very recently, and I mean very recently, there was no fire ecology of agriculture. Fire was something that went on and we had to replace it. I mean, even now you see it denounced in India. Well, it's overdone. And because you've got so much other junk in the air from industrial combustion, burning coal, that you can't tolerate it anymore. Um, and so it's condemned. But that was that was part of the cycling that created the diversity uh, in those landscapes. And we've re we've eliminated that. I, so I now we have a biodiversity crisis, yeah. as well as as well as a large fire crisis, and we have a crisis in the atmosphere. And um, and and perhaps these are. I mean, we could almost leave. They're linked, right? And and yeah. perhaps from one perspective, the the uh, the wild running fire giant source that was consuming the, that that is perhaps part of the. You could perhaps see that as the root. Or you know, if if you want to speak in a metaphoric or a mythic language, um, but let me uh, ask one question because um, uh, I uh, listened to a podcast about energy recently, where the, the and this was a guy who had studied energy, and he said that our consumption of energy today as individuals would correspond the consumption or production, the work of 70 other individuals. So we have today a, a relatively enormous uh, consumption of energy. And if we would yeah. translate, I, I imagine now if we would translate that into fire, that I have a light bulb burning there, I have a computer, I have a screen. These are all powered uh, engines that would require fire and if, if there was an open fire in here there would need to be a very serious chimney to 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 get all the uh, all the smoke from all yep. this combustion out of here basically if it was an open fire in the middle of room i couldn't sit here because it would be the room would be filled with smoke now that is the reality like the detached the detachment is what in a sense what we are living so so I don't know. Do do you have a, have thoughts about like? That, yeah, I'm I'm speculating a little bit. Free, yeah, no, no. Here's, here's how I would. That? Yeah, I I've developed um, the difference in living landscapes and what I call lithic landscapes. And lithic landscapes are once living, now fossilized. So it's coal, oil, natural gas, whatever. And when we burned in living landscapes, there were all kinds of ecological checks and balances. You can't burn under snow. Uh, so there's a seasonality. It depends. The plants do better if they're uh, dormant rather than living because of moisture. And, and humans can were very effective at flexing those borders, pushing them around, moving them around, extending it, carrying fire to places it wouldn't be naturally. But there were still limits. And if you exceed those limits, the system crashes. You have to abandon it. And it 
it takes a while to recover. But when we started burning lithic landscapes, there are no there are no borders. Uh, what is lithic landscape a, again? Lithic landscapes are my term for fossil uh, fuels, yep. coal. I'm trying for a little alliteration, but I think it only confuses people. <laughs> Nonetheless, when we do that and burn that instead, there are no border. There are there are no sinks comparable yeah. to the sources. We have essentially unlimited amount of stuff to burn, but there's no place for it to go. So we've overloaded the atmosphere. We've overloaded the oceans. We're overloading the land, everything. And now we're seeing the consequences of that. So we have enormous power, but the price of that power is that it's only temporary. And then eventually the whole planet collapses as far as being habitable for us. Yeah. And so we're that's already seeing it. And, but in the meantime, we've used that power to shape a way of living on the land. Okay. So let's say we're successful in relatively short period of time. And we replace that primary power with renewables. Does that mean the fires go away? No, because they will integrate that landscape. And if we live on the land the same way, we just have a different primary source of energy. We've still got the same fire problems. We may not have it aggravated by climate change, but we still have very serious problems. In the United States, we, the big fire, the big push for fire suppression began in 1910. We had huge fires and an agency, a forest service that was very young and was traumatized by these fires and determined it would never happen again. So they were going to eliminate all fires. Well, 50 years later, this, this was revealed as a very bad idea because <laughs> it made things worse. Uh, it's a case of trying to control everything and losing control in the process. So we have we spent 50 years trying to take out fire and we've spent 50 years trying to put good fire back in. Turns out fire can be good or bad and we need to discriminate. So that all happened well before climate change was an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and now climate change is amplifying the effects. It, it's a performance enhancer. But all those problems pre-existed climate change yeah. at a serious scale. So <laughs> uh, we're going to have it again. Mm. I mean, my vision is that uh, in the future, if we're lucky, we can eliminate these large mega fires that are just damaging people, towns, and ecosystems. But we will be doing more burning than we are now. Because yeah. that's going to be a necessary part of it. And we have to relearn how to do that to be keepers of the flame once again. Yeah. And that surprises a lot of people because they think the the dangerous fires, fire and smoke will go away because no, it isn't. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let me, let I, me, um, uh, uh, pitch a thought to you. This is something that I've, heard people say people who are wiser than me when it comes to for instance climate change um and these things and that is that some people say that uh we should have gone nuclear uh and that uh, i heard that there are people now who are developing micro nuclear power plants with yeah. a very high level of security because the thing and the, the logic behind this is that we need to get combustion stopped now if, if we're going to have any yeah. chance of surviving as organized human communities. And we cannot stop energy and we cannot replace it all with windmills. It's not quick enough. Yeah. And even if it did, you know, the whole, the entire CO2 emission equation might not even, you know, basically yeah. better things much. Yeah. But nuclear energy is so there's so much power in it that uh, that uh, you know you can put in a power plant and then you have supplied bangladesh with energy 
Uh, what do you think about that 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 solution model to our combustion? Well, I uh, think it's a partial solution, and I would be in favor of it. Yeah. Um, and I mean, we've had very very good success with uh, powering submarines uh, and other vessels uh, with small nuclear plants, and uh, yeah, they're going to be vulnerable. There are trade offs with anything. We know that we can't continue to combust, and I don't want to pave over the world with solar panels. Uh, why we're doing it on landscapes, I don't understand. They should be on buildings, and then they go directly, so we don't have transmission problems, um, et cetera, et cetera. But we need we need to be thinking about those. But let me throw a, an even bigger, what we call curve, or a, a bigger uh, provocation at you. Mm. I mean, I can remember when I was in graduate school, the word was from climatologists that we were headed for a new ice age. Mm. And it was inevitable. I mean, we've had a very long interglacial. If you look at the history of intergla we're we're towards the end, maybe you know, a few hundred years, maybe a couple thousand, but it's ending. The ice is coming and there's nothing we can do to stop it. This is locked into the geophysics of the Earth as a planet, and ice is much more terrible than fire. So, uh, and they had worked out the Milankovitch cycles. and the, I mean, this was it. This is just arithmetic. Well, we broke that. Yeah. And we broke it by combustion. And we're now using fire. We're driving out ice everywhere. We're overdoing it. We have a runaway fire age. But the other reason to keep that stuff in the ground now is because all those, all those geophysical rhythms are still in place. And we may need to burn a hell of a lot of coal and stuff in the future to fight off the ice. <laughs> I mean, we have shown we can disrupt the climate, and now we're in the business of having to manage it. So that's you know far range. I mean, to me, that would that would have a nice ring to it because fire saves us once again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we have to manage the fire properly. Yeah. To do that. I think in this part of the world where I am now, uh, I think the uh, one of the big fears in climate change is not so much that we will face a heating, but the the thing is that Northern Europe is fairly high on the planet. If you yeah. like, if you look at a globe and you pull a line from where I live to North America, then you'll find I don't know Baffin Island or something like that. <laughs> Uh, and that's because the, the Gulf Stream heats Gulf us Stream, quite yeah. significantly. So if the if the um, uh, if the currents in the seas change and the the Gulf Stream switches off, then Europe is yeah. suddenly located somewhere in in British Columbia uh, or something like that, and that is going to change a lot of things. Uh, and uh, like uh, places like. Norway and Sweden, uh, uh, they, they might be located in Alaska, uh, and uh, so, <laughs> so, so. You know, uh, I, no, I, 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 yep, I agree. I mean, we've yeah. disrupted the climate. Now, now it's it's on us to manage it. Yeah, and combustion may be a part of that. And I would favor anything. I, I mean, I. I think nuclear power is a lot different than it was 50 years ago. And I, I think we're crazy not not to use it with as much protection as we can. But we know that if we continue to do what we're doing now, the place is going to be un, uninhabitable. Yeah. And, and it, so not, we have yeah. to try it. And, and sooner the technology exists. And in a short period of time could be adapted with minimum disruption, I think, of of ecosystems and other other knock-on effects. Yeah, there are going to be problems and it's a subject, it could be, you know, an object of terrorist attacks and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But well, I think you did, that, if, I I think well what are you going to do? I I I I I think I agree with that. It's it's not something I, I know a lot about, but I think like considering Hum the 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 the, uh, the topic of human suffering alone. If we have Sahara moving a couple of hundred kilometers south into West Africa, where there are hundreds of millions of people living, uh, 
and we have uh, we have disrupted ag agricultural systems yeah. through densely populated areas going in through South uh, Southern Asia, um, where say the rice harvests uh, fails three years in a row, like the human catastrophes that we're talking about, they are on a scale that makes Pol Pot and the Second World War and Mao and Stalin and King Leopold in, in, in Congo and everything that we know in terms of hu human suffering look like, uh, uh, you know, a Sunday school picnic in, in the comparison to what we're looking at. So I think like it's I think it's the, the responsible position is to be very, very open and 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 ready to to compromise with your own idiosyncrasies. <laughs> basically well, um look we're going to be compromising whatever we do and there are going to be trade-offs mm, yeah. and considering the trade-offs i mean nothing is risk-free no on all of this so uh i'm i'm i think we're to the point where we could do it that that would be part of my my argument in fact i've to dial the conversation back just a little bit i propose that we have created a pyrocene which is to say the fire equivalent of an ice age. And if you, uh, and it's it goes beyond just climate, all the other sorts of things that roll into it. So what do ice ages have? I mean, they have great ice sheets, mountain glaciers, uh, the expanding uh, sea ice, um, mass extinctions, changes in sea level, shifts in biogeography, all the, well, that's exactly what we're seeing now except that it's being informed by fire. And we're, and in a sense, we are driving out the ice and replacing it with, with a fire-powered um, surrogate. And so that's my way of expanding just beyond climate change and suggesting the ways in which all these things can kind of begin to float together, in this case, driven by fire. And I think we have been doing that all of the Holocene, personally, we have at the at the Holocene begins. Uh, we have a fire receptive world. It's rapidly warming, and we have a fire wielding creature who can go everywhere. And the two begin interacting. We have a kind of mutual assistance pact with fire, and you know we each expand the range of the other. Uh, but it was always nudging and shoving. And when we started burning fossil fuels, the whole thing went on afterburners. It's completely out of control. Um, and now we have a runaway fire age. I think we've been working that way for a long time. Uh, and I think we have ha affected the climate. Uh, but uh, now it's <laughs> now it's just yeah. insane. Yeah, it's gone completely. So anyway, that's time. that's my that's my pyromantic uh, pirate prism view of it. So I also welcome uh, your your animism. Uh, sense because I think it's a way of reconnecting, and in a sense, animism is a positive uh, pushback on the Enlightenment, um, which in many ways did a lot of damage. I mean, it did lots of good things, but there, again, there are always trade offs, and uh, we're seeing some of the consequences of that, and in a sense, the arrogance that was implicit with it. Yes, and a little more humility, a little more connectedness with the things that shape our life. I think would would be welcome. Totally, totally, and and I think that, like you say, in in so many ways, animism is is a way of relating relating in very concrete ways to something that's very concrete. Yeah. If you perceive something as say sacred in in our contemporary language often it would be something that is very useful. Like th there isn't that kind of separation that, for instance, we have a, yeah. a pragmatic secular sphere and then we have a sacred religious sphere. Uh, fire would be uh, sacred and in relation exactly because it keeps us warm, exactly because it, it, yeah. it cooks our food and uh, gives us light and uh, serves ceremonial purposes and cooks 
iron out of ore and cooks earth into clay vessels and all these different things. I think, by the way, this this idea that you presented here in the beginning about cooking as the essential technology is a very beautiful image of of how fire is is foundational to to anything we do basically like you you could probably go on in technologies we cook you know clothes when we color them we cook and and so on and so forth yeah so and and yeah i i think think of animism or one way of thinking of animism is this uh almost pragmatic down to earth relating with materiality yeah. basically and that that's what i that's what i found particularly refreshing in your in your discussions the the materiality of it not just the technologies of starting fire but the sense that we need we need to uh to reground it i really think we got through some really really nice things here it's I, I really find your perspective incredibly, uh, incredibly sort of in like it's so sharp, but yet so big that 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 when scholarship is best, it takes one little thing that just kind of opens. I would I would say one one other thing uh, again, ground trying to ground it in the material. One reason I think fire is so prominent in rites and ceremonies is because if it occurs at night or if it occurs indoors, you need light and you may very well need heat. So fire is, becomes an inevitable presence and then it becomes incorporated into the ritual, maybe even after the time we no longer need heat and light from fire. At, at that point, then we begin thinking, well, fire is just allegorical, it's symbolic, it's whatever, it's some kind of symbolic ecosystem. No, this is where it came from. It was with us all the time. It's always with us. Yeah. And there, there's a, there's a, I've been studying a fire history. Of, I'll, I'll be brief here. The stuff, fire history of Mexico, it's coming out soon. And it's very interesting. Their gods, their fire ceremonies, and they have a, what they call the old God, who's just this sort of shriveled, uh, missing a, a tooth, hunched over a, a, a brazier. So it's, there it is, the clicking, the hearth is sort of at the core of everything. And he hybridizes with all this other stuff. So we don't have one singular God in a kind of Judeo-Christian tradition that will have no other before it. This is a God that hybridizes with this and with that and with something else. And so it's always there. It's just pervasive. Um, and they have a, the Aztecs had a spectacular new fire ceremony, by the way, where they would extinguish every fire and then start at 52 years. They would start over with a ceremonial fire and rekindle all over the all over the empire. Oh wow! It's a That's... great. It's a great. It's a it's a fabulous ceremony. New yeah. fire. So anyway, I, I but I my point was that it's always with us, or has yeah. always been with us, yeah. and so it got incorporated into everything. And it's so intuitive. I, I think I think the similar often the similarity across cultures, like what you describe there, shutting closing all the fires and then having a new one. I mean, that is what people would do in Scottish or Swedish okay. villages, not on an Aztec imperial scale, but on on a village scale, people would, if there, for instance, if there was a problem, uh, cattle disease, they would close out all the yeah. fires and then churn a new fire and then uh, then um, uh, per, use that fire to carry that fire to different farmsteads. And like Ian Walton uh, described to me, this churning of these very heavy uh, fire drill, that requires a group of men that pulls hard. So if you have yeah. a very heavy fire dr drill that is pulled by perhaps nine men, uh, then obviously the, the, the friction of that tip into the fire board, that has a lot of energy. So yeah. you, you, you almost have like a whole community coming together and the the communal yeah. energy of that community is basically like literally, not symbolically, but literally produce, giving birth to that fire. I, I, and I find these, these traditions to be, they, they, they are intuitive in a way that, that it makes sense that they are uh, very widespread. Perhaps some aspects of them are universal uh, among yeah. different human cultures. 
Hey, listen, this has been fun. I don't I I rarely get to talk to someone who's interested in fire, uh certainly in, in your way or or has that enthusiasm. So thank you for inviting me to uh converse. Great. Thank you very much, uh Professor Pine, for taking the time and coming on here uh, on here. It was absolutely fascinating to to hear your uh your perspective on this. So uh but if there's any homepage or books you have coming up that you want to mention because then perhaps the followers of this channel can 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 look for you sure. and well I, I have a book uh, called the pyrocene which is a very short book that distills a lot of what i understand about fire in it and that was published a couple of years ago um and i have a book on the fire history of mexico which is very interesting because of the colonial context and the interaction of different understandings of fire uh, and that will be called five sons and that goes back to the it's organized by the new fire ceremony so there were five eras each with its own son and that's how i organize uh the epochs of of fire in mexico great so. great thank you very much for coming on here oh thank you Yeah.